if you're looking for a usable Bitcoin wallet, Sparrow wallet is a great Bitcoin wallet with a beautiful uh, user interface, user experience. So in this special tutorial, I'm going to go through this guide with a tutorial with Economy Alchemist. We have already covered Samurai wallet, Blue wallet, Mobile wallet, and this time it's a desktop wallet. You can set up, you know, with a single wallet or multi-sig wallet. It's uh, the experience, you know, is let's say pretty much similar to Spectre wallet, but Sparrow wallet, you know, is is a uh, is a little bit more user friendly, and you can all, you know, you can connect it to your to your node uh, with whatever. So we're going to go through the details how you can connect it to your node with us via Tor Onion address or through you know uh, Bitcoin Core, uh, Electrum. So uh, yeah, looking forward and hope you're gonna enjoy this. If you have any questions, let me know. Make sure you follow me and Econa Alchemist on Twitter and check out his website, EconaAlchemist.com and uh, the previous uh, tutorials you can uh, check out on my YouTube channel or just as an audio on all major podcast platforms. But I guess uh, YouTube is much easier for instructional guide. So looking forward to that and hope you're going to enjoy this. Let me know your questions. My email is kd at kvandavane.com or DM me on Twitter, Telegram, LinkedIn, what have you. So without further ado, this is the Spare Wallet tutorial with Economy Alchemist. Hey, Economy Alchemist, welcome to the show. Good morning. I know morning. it's probably afternoon <laughs> there, but it's morning yeah, here. It is. <laughs> So listen, we've covered a blue wallet. We've covered a uh, samurai wallet in this series of tutorial. Um, and I actually su German subbed or translated uh, the samurai uh, episode even into German. So now we're going into Sparrow, right? This time. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's a great, it's a great, uh, uh, really UX. Uh, it's a Bitcoin wallet. It's actually much smoother to be honest with you and uh i mean for people who haven't had experience with um with specter where you can also create a single wallet or multi-sig wallet uh but the spare wallet i don't know it just has um uh, it's got this uh just smoother user interface user experience and much faster setup so yeah the stage is yours economy alchemist um uh, you can share the screen and we'll go step by step. And I'm sure there are a few specific questions I have for the listeners, uh, for newbies, uh, but we can kick it off. Thanks so much. Awesome. Yeah. And this, this isn't designed to be a lecture. So, you know, feel free to jump in at any time and sure. ask me questions and it'll make it more interactive. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and then start the PowerPoint. Okay, you can see that all right? Yep. Cool. So yeah, like you were saying, the user interface in Sparrow is uh, very sleek. It's very well designed. Um, Sparrow Wallet is focused a lot on bringing uh, a good desktop installed wallet to users. Uh, they focus on privacy. It's got Tor built in. It's got a ton of functionality. Um, you can do multi-sig wallets. You can use it as like a miniature block explorer. You can inspect your transactions. Um, they actually just added a feature in a recent update where you can like scroll through the hex of your transaction and it'll like populate a small dialog box that tells you like what that piece of hex data actually represents inside the transaction. Um, so it's just pretty cool to be able to look at, you know, your transactions in more detail and understand the kind of information that you're basically sharing with the world when you send a Bitcoin transaction because it is a public ledger. Um, I think Sparrow Wallet is a great 
starter wallet for anyone who's interested on installing a Bitcoin wallet on desktop. Um, and, you know, this is, as you mentioned, part of a bigger series where we talked about Samurai wallet on Android, Blue wallet on iPhone, and now a Sparrow wallet on desktop. So, you know, if anyone's interested in a mobile device wallet, they can check out the other parts of the series. Uh, but this one's only focused on desktop and um, Sparrow wallets able to be installed on like Linux, um, Mac OS and Windows. In this guide, I'm just doing Windows. I don't cover the other two operating systems. So let's get started. Um, so just as an introduction, you know, I'm not being paid or endorsed by any of the companies, products or services that I mentioned in these slides for any of the content that I've generated here. Uh, I'm not an expert. Don't trust anything I say. Verify for yourself. I am an open book. I like to just share information as I learn it. Um, when you have questions, ask for help. My DMs are open. I'm really easy to get a hold of on Twitter, Telegram. Um, but every wallet team that we've mentioned in this series maintains a very active uh, Telegram channel and their community members for each of the wallets on Telegram. So like if any of your viewers are having any trouble, they can always jump in that Telegram group, post a question, and they should get a response pretty quick from somebody in the community. Um, that Telegram is a great resource. This guide is designed for absolute beginners. So the concepts here are just more like high level. Um, I'm, I'm really trying to just give people enough information to get off of zero and install their first Bitcoin wallet. You know, I'm not gonna drill down into really technical details in this guide, you know, so there's, there's other documentation out there in the world for that. Um, and if you are trying this for the first time, just start with small amounts of Bitcoin until these concepts get a little bit more comfortable and things start clicking and making more sense and, and you can start working with larger amounts of Bitcoin. So Sparrow Wallet is a desktop software application. It's designed to be used with your own Bitcoin full node. So that, that's one important distinction about this wallet compared to some of the other wallets we've covered. Um, anytime you're interacting with Bitcoin, if you're not using your own node, then you're trusting someone else's node. And so Sparrow is designed so that you can connect it to your own Bitcoin node. And the, the full version of this tutorial that we're going over today, it's available on my website, econoalchemist.com. And in that article, uh, I connect links to node implementations that people can try if they don't already have their own Bitcoin full node. But in this tutorial, you know, we're assuming that the user already has a Bitcoin node set up and that's what we're gonna be using to connect to with Sparrow Wallet here. Um, so in this example, I'm gonna connect Sparrow Wallet to my Raspberry Pi. It runs Bitcoin Core uh, and Sparrow Wallet can be downloaded from their website, sparrowwallet.com. And this is what their the like home page on their website looks like. Uh, as of um, today is uh, April 24th, 2021. What's the, uh, the current or latest uh, version of Sparrow? Is it 1.3.2? Oh, that's a good question. I didn't check before I hopped on. I the... think it is 1.3.2, but it doesn't matter. But it's not a, like an automatic up, update or upgrade, right? You have to manually upgrade every time or check if there's a new up, uh, upgrade, right? Or does it give you right. an alarm or something like some kind of warning or notice uh, that it's not up to date? Yeah. No, you have to do it manually. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I'm not installing this guide but put 
this guy together be like two months ago, like February. Um, so if if you do see a version in here or in any of my guides that they be out of date, um, it, and that that actually brings up a good point. Any anyone following along at home, they should always be using like the most recent hash values version numbers from the wallet developers site don't rely on hash values and version numbers that are presented in my slides because they could be out of date did i lose you kivan no no i'm still here i just turned off my my video and i might uh, turn off your video for bandwidth uh reasons oh uh, was it getting choppy yeah, yeah. So I just turned off both of our videos, but you know, as long as we can, uh, you know, see the screen sharing, it's it's, it's wonderful. Okay. Is there is there any um, details I should go over again that maybe got uh, lost? No, when, when it... no. The only aspect I think that uh, uh, which I had really a positive experience with is just connecting it via the Onion you know, tour address of, for example, of my node, because I'm on my node. So I just, you know, copy and paste it uh, with the, with, you know, with a specific port, with the, with the correct port uh, and connect it, you know, Sparrow via the Onion tour address. And maybe you can go, you know, a little bit over that. Okay. Um, in, in this guide, you know, it's only connecting to my Bitcoin node, like on my local home network. So I didn't uh, configure Tor. Yeah, it just, you know, one you of know, the, yeah, that's just, you know, for people who, for example, you know, who have a MyNode, they just go into the dashboard of MyNode, into Tor services and their specific address. You know, I think it's, which one is it? I think it's the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure which one it is, uh, what it is called. Maybe it's the Electrum. It could be the Electrum Tor address. Oh, or yeah, yeah. The exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's the Tor Onion address, which you just, you know, with a specific port. Um, oh, okay. I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, that's what you just copy and paste and then insert it into the Sparrow and it would, in, it, it really seamlessly connected to it. It just took a while and maybe you have to refresh it or start, you know, uh, start the Sparrow wallet new uh, or again. And, and then it just, you know, it, it really was a charm. Like uh, even for the first time, it maybe took a while, but, but, but it did connect. And uh, so, yeah, maybe just share your experiences with. Yeah. So, you know, with this one, I, I did it a little bit differently. I was I wasn't using the Electrum server. I was just using my Bitcoin Core full node, um, and you know, in my particular version of Bitcoin Core, there's like a, uh, a command you can put in the configuration file for your node to index all the transactions so that you can you can search. Um, so my, you know, I, I, that's enough versatility, uh, for my needs with, with my, with that particular node. Um, so I didn't, I didn't get into Electrum in here. Um, so I can't really speak to that, but no, no, um, that's okay. Um, I think that's, that's, that's fine because I actually was going to ask you, what if you have just, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I have a Bitcoin core downloaded, uh, that was for Spectre. Uh, so, uh, I can, if I want to, I can open Spectre and, and it's, you know, and it's connected directly, you know, via Bitcoin core. So actually it's a, it's a, a pretty good, you know, uh, option. There's, there's some options you have, I guess, you know, how, how you connect your Sparrow wallet. Yeah. Yeah. And Sparrow wallet has like a, a ton of, of vers versatility built into it. I mean, you can. You can use Electrum server. You can use, you know, any node implementation that you have. You can you can use that to connect Sparrow. So it's it's it it doesn't discriminate, and it's got a lot of versatility built into it. Uh, you know, one important thing is to verify any software that you're downloading. So I'm not gonna really get into 
all the steps required to to verify PGP signatures in this guide. Um, but again, in my article on my website, I do link to some good tutorials. Um, so if any of your users are not familiar with PGP signatures, they should check that out. But, you know, I will say just at like a very high level, I used Cleopatra and basically the too long didn't read is that you input the developer's public key and then you download the signed hash value of the software application file that you downloaded and that hash value is signed by the developer and then you verify that signature using Cleopatra against the developer's public key. And then you take the file that you downloaded and you calculate your own hash value on it. And then you compare that hash value to the known signed hash value that you know is valid. And as long as those two hash values match, then you can rest a little easier knowing that the software you downloaded is an accurate representation of what it was purported to be when you downloaded it. Yeah, I think that's a separate or, or you know, it's good that you, you know, have uh, made some uh, guides or tutorials on, on how to verify. And I think it's important. I, I also use Cleopatra. Most of the time it works pretty seamlessly. And for the checksum, I use HXD. And I just uh, usually I have to ask like what is the checksum, and then I just import you know the the exa file into the HXD, uh, do the checksum for you know the SHA whatever two five six, uh, and and then I just compare the checksum uh, uh, numbers, and yeah, and most of the time it it works, but sometimes it just you know there's some issue either with Cleopatra or or I don't have the checksum so. So yeah, so I think people should go separately into that and, and take a look how to verify for every whatever software they're downloading. It's actually a good practice. There's a lot of nuance in, in PGP signatures and that's you know why I don't really dive into it here. But it is important and it is you know good security hygiene to be comfortable with verifying PGP signatures. Um, you know, it, it took me a lot of uh, tries and some experience and trial and error to, to, re to really understand how the workflow of PGP signatures worked and how to save the files with the right extension and which files were, were doing what and what sequence they go into in the event. So, you know, there's a lot to it, but just try it. If, if you're a new user, just start trying it and, you know, keep trying it. Don't give up. You'll get it eventually. And there's a lot of good guides out there that I link to to help you out. Um, so, yeah, at this point, you know, you should have downloaded Sparrow Wallet. Hopefully you verify the PGP signature. And then once you've got it installed on your machine, uh, you can just run that executable file. And once it's installed and launched, uh, this is one of the first windows that you see. And so I turn it to offline mode because I want to set up the server configuration manually. Um, and if it's in online mode, then I do believe it will try to like automatically connect to some known Electrum servers. Um, but I wanted to connect it to my own node. So, so that's why when you see this screen, I turn it to offline mode. And then one of the next is you'll be in this general settings tab. And then here you can do some basic general settings, like the unit that you want Bitcoin displayed in the source of the uh, fee rate information. So mempool is a great source for that, mempool.space. Um, the like fiat currency that you'd like the wallet to display values in, um, the exchange source. 
So like, where is it getting the information related to the current Bitcoin price for that currency? Um, coin selection, notifications. So all of those general settings can be set up here. And then next you're gonna do the server settings. And you'll want to enter your Bitcoin nodes local IP address and username here. Um, but you know, there's, there's another step here. You, that information also needs to be set up in your Bitcoin.com file, which is short for um, Bitcoin.configuration. Um, so when you have Bitcoin Core installed on your Raspberry Pi, you'll be able to access that Bitcoin.com file. And in there is a, a lot of um, options for configuring how your Bitcoin node is going to operate. Um, but, you know, you can either do that from if you have like the graphical user interface set up for your Bitcoin core node, you can launch that file from there. Or if you if you're just running in command line, you want to you want to like change directory to the folder where that Bitcoin dot conf file is saved, and then run the command sudo nano Bitcoin conf, and that's going to open up that file, and then you can edit whatever you need to edit, and then um, save that file. So. Now we're just gonna like take a look at what needs to be changed in that bitcoin.conf file. So once you get that open, um, you wanna make sure that you've got the, the information that I have here in blue text, blue and black text. You wanna make sure that you have that information entered. Um, so RPC bind, RPC bind is being used to, um, we have that set to the local network IP address of my Raspberry Pi. So that's the one that ends in 11. And then the computer, the desktop computer that I have Sparrow Wallet installed on is the one you want to set for RPC allow IP. So that's the one ending in 12 at the, at the bottom of that list. And then also I don't show it here because, you know, I don't want to expose my Bitcoin core username and password, but also in this file, you're going to see um, RPC user and password, and you're going to want to set those um, to you know whatever you want to set those at use a strong password that can't be guessed easily and then you're going to tell sparrow wallet that information so that it has the username password to ping your bitcoin core node so you know once you add these lines in there or you may already have these lines in your file but they might have a hashtag in front of them um, if you like delete that hashtag, then the system's gonna look at that line as valid. But if it has a hashtag in front of it, the system's just gonna ignore that line. Yeah, So I mean, I'm um, hoping for the for the noob that it's already in there, you just need to remove the hashtag. But the only question I have, I mean, you know, for the average user, the noob, where, where do you exactly find these, like, okay, RPC bind, uh, like, okay, you can find that in your node somewhere, I guess, and, RPC allow like if it's not in there like how do you how do you find your RPC allow IP like is is that like easily uh, uh, can you easily find it or or, or yeah you... so that's a good question so the the two IP addresses I have here with the that start with one nine two dot one six eight so like those are just my local home network IP addresses and so. Like any anyone who's at home with computers connected to their Wi-Fi or their their DSL internet or whatever, 
every device on their local home network is going to have like a 192.168.0. Dot, you know, zero through 99 IP address. And you can just log into your router at home and your router will tell you there'll, there'll be a, a tab in, in that configuration page of your router where you can find the IP addresses for all the devices that are connected on your local network. And if you've never, if you've never um, logged into your router from home before, it, it's really easy. You just, from a computer that's connected to your local home network, uh, you just open your web browser. And then the router is, is always the first um, IP address. So like the router should always be like 192.168.0.1. And that should bring up like the administrative login page for your router. And then usually, you know, unless you've already changed the password to your router, it should just be like admin. And then the password's like one, two, three, four, or sometimes password. But um, if you just do an internet search for your router manufacturer, it should give you the information you need to, to log in. And then once you get logged into your router, um, you can change the password if you want or um, do all sorts of modifications to your router. But the important thing for this guide is that in there, there's a, a tab where you're going to find a list of all the devices connected on your home network that are talking to that router. And that's where you're going to be able to figure out which one of those IP addresses is your Bitcoin node, your Raspberry Pi, and which one of them is the desktop computer that you're on. Okay, so but, that's where I got these yeah, numbers. Yeah, okay. From. But, but, but you, I mean, usually it's, it should be in there just automatic by default. Like if you have the, the, the Bitcoin core already downloaded, installed, it all these like uh, uh, these IP addresses are already in there with hashtag and you just need to and then you would, uh, I mean, that would be the optimal situation where you just remove the hashtag. So uh. I think, I think, uh, no, unfortunately, you know, there's, there's no way for Bitcoin core to like figure out which IP addresses are which. So in the configuration file for Bitcoin core, it's just going to have some like generic IP address that like may or may not necessarily be what you need to have there. Mm -hmm. um, most likely it's not going to be the correct IP address. So, you know, you're definitely going to need to get onto your router and figure out what your Raspberry Pi IP address is and what your desktop IP address is. And then like the, the one, two, seven dot zero dot zero dot one that I believe I got that information off of the Sparrow Wallet website. Um, so Sparrow Wallet has like a really great step-by-step -step guide with a, with a lot more detail on like how to get Sparrow Wallet up and running. Um, and I, I do believe like I had to try this a few different times before I actually got it to work. Um, so, you know, any users doing this at home, like, don't get frustrated. It, it It's not unique to you that it may not work on the first try. Like I had to do this several times where I opened up the configuration file. I tried a certain IP address. I saved the configuration file. I restarted Bitcoin Core and then tried connecting from Sparrow Wallet and it failed. And then I'd have to go back and do everything, all, make an edit to the configuration file and, and do it all over again. Um, and that's that's just part of you know working out all the bugs and and getting everything set up right. So it can take a few tries. Don't get don't get frustrated. All right. Now I'll put uh, I'll I'll add the the link to the spare wallet guide. Maybe additionally, you know, as a as an additional guide uh, in the show notes. Yeah, it definitely help. And I link to it too in my article mm -hmm. on my website. Um, so yeah, once once you do get the configuration file set up, 
then you'll see that like I put the the IP address for my Bitcoin Core Raspberry Pi here, and then I put the port number eighty three thirty two, and then I clicked on the user password tab, and I used the same username and password that I had set up in my Bitcoin Core configuration file. So all the information in the configuration file and in the server settings here in Sparrow Wallet are now matching. Uh, and then you can, you know, name your wallet, whatever you want to. And then you're going to have um, a chance to test that connection. And once you hit test connection, it'll either tell you that it failed and if it does, then you need to go back to your Bitcoin Core configuration file and try and make sure you got the right IP address or the right password or you know whatever setting you need to change in there. Um, but once it succeeds, then you should see something like this show up in the window. And then you know that your desktop and the Sparrow Wallet application are now communicating with your Raspberry Pi Bitcoin Core node, which is um a pretty good pretty good accomplishment for bitcoin beginners um so yeah and again you know it could take a few tries to get everything right but don't give up you will persevere and so once you get through the server settings then this is one of the first windows you're going to see in your Sparrow Wallet application. Uh, and the first thing you're going to want to do is set up your, your Bitcoin wallet. So there's a ton of different options here. You can connect a hardware wallet. Um, you can connect an air-gapped hardware wallet where you're not connecting your hardware device to the computer, which is... Um, if you're using a hardware wallet, that's the recommendation I make. It's a good way, a secure way to do it. Um, or you can just make a new wallet from scratch, which is what we're going to do in this guide. Um, or if you already have a backup phrase for a wallet that you want to import, you can do, do that here. Um, or you can set up Sparrow as like a watch only wallet where you put in certain information about your Bitcoin wallet and it'll be able to display balances and generate new Bitcoin addresses for you, but it will not be able to spend that Bitcoin. Um, it can just watch the wallet and tell you what the balance is, um, but it, it can't actually sign for those transactions. Yeah, and you know, the positive experience I had, um, because you know, I did it differently. I didn't you know, connect it with Bitcoin because I'm, I'm usually at my girlfriend's uh, home. And so I'm, I'm not on my local network. That's why I didn't even go into the you know, Bitcoin configuration or anything. So I just connected it via Tor Onion address and I imported the spec, my spec wallet or whatever single, even for, even for my girlfriend, you know, uh, so to my uh, Tor Onion address and just imported the, the uh, what do you call it? The JSON file. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that worked really, really smooth, you know. Good. So you use that, this one, the import mm -hmm. function. Good. Um, and that's, you know, another cool thing is you can set up like si single signature wallet or multi-sig wallet. You can choose to do that from here. Uh, you can choose the script type. You can do that here. Um, I, I would recommend just leaving it on the um, pay to witness public key hash, I believe is what that acronym stands for. That's like the native SegWit uh, Bitcoin addresses. These are the ones that start with BC1. And typically these kinds of Bitcoin addresses are going to save you a little bit of money on transaction fees versus like the legacy exactly yeah Bitcoin addresses that start with one or the nested SegWit addresses that start with three um, so you can you can choose whatever you want but you know 
I, I just recommend sticking with the native SegWit. Uh, so yeah. Oh, and another thing, Sparrow Wallet is going to get some information from your node and just make sure that it's updating and synced with um, the most current Bitcoin um, network state. So you'll see that information going on here at the bottom until that's all caught up to date. And then that should turn green, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah. Okay, so once you've clicked on that generate new wallet uh, on the previous screen, you should see a screen like this. And one of the first options you'll have is to select how many uh, seed words you want to have in your seed phrase. I recommend just leaving it at 24, but you can do 12, 18, 24. There might even be a couple other options in there as well. Uh, so select your word size and then hit generate new. And once you do that, Sparrow Wallet is going to use its random number generator to come up with these 24 words. And for anyone who's not familiar with this, the, the 24 words here are just the human readable format of a very long complex and unique number that is your wallet's private key. And so these, these 24 words are super important. If, if anything happens to your desktop computer, um, if it gets stolen or damaged or the hard drive seizes up, like you need to have these 24 words backed up and secured somewhere so that you can recreate your Bitcoin wallet later. Um, but we'll get into that on the next slide. And then the other option you'll have here below the 24 words is to add a passphrase. You can think of this as like a 25th word, which is, um, you know, unique to you. I do not recommend using something as simple as my example here. Personally, I recommend using high entropy passwords that cannot be guessed easily. Other people recommend using uh, passwords that you can memorize. But, you know, weigh your own trade-offs and figure out what works best for you. Uh, but I, I definitely do recommend putting a passphrase on there. So the passphrase is important because in the event that an adversary gets control of your 24 words, they can recreate your Bitcoin wallet unless you have a passphrase set. And if you have a, a strong passphrase set, then your adversary will not be able to access your Bitcoin funds. Um, they will need to know what your passphrase is in order to be able to spend your Bitcoin. So if you keep your passphrase secured separately from your 24 words and someone finds one or the other, then they only have one piece of information that they need instead of both pieces. So having this 25th word is just like an added security precaution that I, I highly recommend using. So when you are presented with these 24 words, it's a good idea to write them down on a piece of paper, and then you're going to confirm this backup. When you hit confirm backup, it, the wallet's going to ask you, have these 24 words been written down? And then it's going to, test you and make sure that you did write them down. So this is where I want to go over a couple things for anyone who's new to Bitcoin. And if this is your first Bitcoin wallet that you're setting up, don't ever share these words with anyone. Do not take a screenshot of these words. 
do not save them on your computer. You do not want to have these words in a digital format. The, one of the best things you can do is just to write them down on a piece of paper and then secure that piece of paper as if as though it were gold or jewelry. If you take a, a picture of these words with your phone or you copy and paste them into a text file and save them on your computer, or if you have them in any sort of digital format, then eventually someone's gonna gain access to your computer or someone's gonna gain access to your phone, which means they can gain access to these words. And if someone has access to those words and your passphrase, then they can spend your Bitcoin without you knowing about it and they can steal your Bitcoin funds. So it's really important to keep these words out of a digital format and to write them down on a piece of paper at the very least. I also have guides on how to um, go a step further and imprint these words into a metal plate or into metal washers uh, that way, your seed phrase is now more robust against environmental hazards like flooding and fire, where paper may not survive flooding or fire. So confirm that you wrote down your seed words. And then you're going to take the test and re-enter all your seed words to prove that you wrote them down. And the other important thing here is that when you do back up your seed words on paper or metal, you, you want to make sure that you maintain the same order that they're presented in. Because if you get these words out of order, then it's not going to work when you try to recreate your wallet. So you want to just make sure that you have them in the right order. Um, you know, like I said, if anything happens to your computer and you lose access to your Bitcoin wallet, this is, this is the only thing that's going to get your Bitcoin back for you. So make sure you take that seriously. And then after you've confirmed and re-entered those 24 words, this should be the next screen that you're looking at. Um, I, I recommend just leaving this derivation path as the default path. Um, you know, you, you could change that account number, but then you kind of create some problems. Like if, if you, you would have to make sure you back up that account number too. Uh, so I, I just wouldn't even mess with that. Just leave it as the default, unless you really know what you're doing. And then hit import key store. And that's gonna import the wallet that you just generated. And then the next screen you should see, you're gonna be presented with a fingerprint, the master fingerprint for your wallet, um, which is this, where's my mouse? It's, uh, it's this eight digit code right here. This master fingerprint is important because this is how you can confirm that you entered your 24 words and your passphrase correctly. And if you entered them correctly, then the wallet that gets generated should be able to provide the same checksum or the same fingerprint. And, you know, make note of this and save it with your backup because then you can compare your note to what you're looking at on the screen. And if they match, then you know your wallet will have your funds in it. And if they don't match, then you know that you probably entered one of the words incorrectly or you incorrectly entered your passphrase and then you can go back and try it again. Um, so that's important for restoring a wallet. You don't need to, to, to do that every time you open up your wallet on the, on the computer. That's just for like when you're re regenerating your wallet. And then hit apply. And you can see in my example there that the, you know, by the time I took this screenshot, the Bitcoin uh, network was all caught up. 
and that little field there turned green. You'll also be asked to name your wallet. Uh, so you can name it anything you want. And then it's going to ask you if you want to enter a password. Um, I do recommend using a password. So this is different than your passphrase. This is the password that's encrypting your wallet data for Sparrow Wallet on your computer. So this is, I, I recommend making this a different password than the, the BIP39 passphrase you set for your wallet. This is totally different. So again, I recommend using high entry, high entry passwords that can't be guessed easily. And then your node is going to, to automatically scan the, your new wallet to see if you have any funds. Uh, once your node is done scanning, then you can start generating receive addresses. Um, and you know, we'll, I'll show you how you can deposit some Bitcoin into your new wallet. But basically, you know, what's happening here is your, your Bitcoin core node now sees your wallet. And so it's gonna scan uh, the blockchain to see if there's any transactions that need to be uh, included here to display any funds that you might have in your wallet. So it's just scanning the network to see what you've got, or it's scanning its copy of the blockchain to see if you've got any funds in your new wallet. On the left side of the screen, there's a few different tabs. One of them is receive. And, you know, at this point, you've downloaded Sparrow, you've confirmed the PGP signature, you've configured it to talk to your Raspberry Pi Bitcoin Core node, um, you've generated a new wallet, you've backed up your seed words and your passphrase, you've made note of your fingerprint. Uh, and, and that's pretty much it for the setup. Now you're actually ready to start receiving some Bitcoin. And the way you can receive Bitcoin here is you click on this tab and then you're going to be presented with some information. Some of that information is a QR code. So if uh, the person who you're getting Bitcoin from is there with you physically, they can scan that QR code from their phone and they can send Bitcoin there, or you can copy and paste the actual address. This QR code just represents this address. So you can copy and paste that address um, and transmit that securely to somebody that you're expecting to get Bitcoin from, and they can use that address to send Bitcoin to you. Um, you know, there's, there's some privacy implications there. I would, you know, be careful about using like a Gmail address that is made out of your first name dot last name uh, and, and sending that address. Um, there's just some privacy implications when you start connecting your personal information to the publicly available Bitcoin data. Uh, that's out there on the blockchain. So just be careful of that. So like in this example, you know, I, I used Samurai Wallet or I think I used Samurai Wallet or Blue Wallet, one of the two to just scan that QR code from the last screen. Um, to send my Sparrow wallet some Bitcoin. But once that, once that receipt shows up in Sparrow wallet, then you can start to look at a lot more details about that transaction. And this is why I said that Sparrow wallet is like a miniature block explorer. You can, you can go in and look at all of the inputs to the transaction. Um, and you can look at all of the outputs. 
from that transaction, you can look at the transaction ID. Um, you can copy that transaction and go look at it in another block explorer if you have one that you prefer to use. Um, you know, again, just be cautious of searching transaction IDs like on ClearNet because potentially that could get linked to personal information about you. So if you're going to do that, I recommend using the Tor browser uh, to look up your block explorers. You can see the transaction size, um, the amount that was sent, uh, the fee rate that was paid. And then you can see some more blockchain information like how many confirmations the transaction has had, what block that transaction was included in, the timestamp, um, the block hash. Um, and then down here, you can see a bunch of hex information about that transaction. <clears throat> and this is um, one of the things I mentioned earlier where like in the newest version of Sparrow Wallet, you can actually just kind of hover your mouse over these bits of hex data and it'll populate a little dialog box that tells you like what that piece of data represents. Um, so like if you hovered over a section, it would tell you like, this is where the block height is indicated in, in this information, or this is where the input address is indicated in this information. So it's just kind of interesting to see how it's all put together. Um, once you click on, that was in the transaction section. And then once you click on like the inputs, it'll show you this cool little pop about like the biggest input versus the smallest input the addresses of those inputs, uh, the total amount of sats that was sent. Um, and then you can go further and look at the outputs of that transaction. Um, and you can see the size of the outputs. Uh, so it's pretty neat to see all that. Not a lot of wallets give you this much detail about your transactions. Uh Hey Matt, can you explain, um, you know, just for the basics um, of, of, of a, uh, you know, for a noob, um, what is an input? What's an output? Like input, like basically input is uh, what what you're uh, sort of receiving, or uh, output is what is outgoing. Or so yeah, that's a that's a great question. So in every Bitcoin transaction, you're going to have inputs and outputs, and the Inputs are what's being used to fund the transaction. So in, in this example, you can see there were five, let's see, one, two, three, yeah, five, five Bitcoin addresses funded this transaction with a total of 7,082,810 Satoshis. So you know, when you're sending Bitcoin and you put in an amount, like I put in here, like 7,082,000 Satoshis, your wallet will send that amount, but you may not have that total amount in a single Bitcoin address in your wallet. Your wallet has several addresses in it. And several of those addresses may contain different amounts of Bitcoin. And so when you want to spend 7,082,000 Satoshis, your wallet's going to take as much Bitcoin as it needs from these addresses to come up with that amount. And then the outputs... You know, so let's say I was only spending like, um, you know, a little bit less than that total amount. Then, you know, one of these outputs should be the change that's getting returned to my original sending wallet. Um, 
So let's say I, I pulled 7 million, 82,000 Satoshis from my wallet. Um, but there was a smaller amount actually being transacted, then the difference in change would be returned to my original wallet. You know, in this example, like I sent 7,082,000. So the total amount of Bitcoin in all five of these addresses may have been more but that change was sent back to a change address in the sender's wallet that provided these inputs. The outputs, then one of these outputs should be the change that's being returned to the sender's wallet. One of these outputs will be the amount that's being received by the receiving wallet. Uh, one of these outputs will be the miner's fee. And in this particular example, um, I, I built like a privacy enhancing transaction that actually sends the decoy output um, so like it, it becomes more difficult on chain to associate particular inputs with particular outputs because of the way I built this transaction. Um, it, it disrupts those common input ownership heuristics. Um, we went over some of that in the Samurai Wallet tutorial. But the way that this one is built, like there's four outputs here. One of them, at least one of them is the change going back to the original sender's wallet. At least one of them is being received by this Sparrow wallet. Um, one of them is the miner's fee. And actually on second thought, the, the miner's fee may not actually be presented here. Um, there might actually be two outputs that are, if I recall correctly, one of these outputs is the change going back to the original wallet. Uh, Another output is change that could be going to the original wallet or could be going to a collaborator, but you can't tell by just looking at it on chain, which is one of the features of the privacy enhancing transaction technique that I used. Um, another wallet is the receipt going into Sparrow. Uh, another output is the receipt going into Sparrow wallet. And then uh, another output is the change going back to either the collaborator or the original sender, but you can't tell by looking at it. You know, for and, and this is probably a bit of a digression, um, and I, I don't want to confuse new users too much, I probably should have just used like a very standard uh, one input, two output transaction type. Um, but I, I guess I just wanted some material to show what the capabilities of these block explorer functions in Sparrow Wallet were. Um, you know, the, the, the main point here is that Sparrow Wallet can display several inputs and several outputs if the transaction had them. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that, you know, people understand the basics, but I don't think, you know, the average noob, you know, is really interested. I mean, I don't know, is was this specific purpose like to to find out like you know, the the sort of the breakup, the breakdown of the of the inputs and outputs like is 
for for a specific reason or for specific purposes? Well, it, it's you know, it's it's just good to be able to familiarize yourself with what's going on under the hood when you're mm -hmm. receiving Bitcoin. Okay. Good. Um, you know, there. I think it's a pretty handy tool to be able to to explore your transactions in more detail where you know most wallets that I've seen don't don't provide you this level of detail mm -hmm. um, but it's good to have it there for the curious um, but it's you know it's not necessary. You know, you can send and receive Bitcoin without getting into this level of detail. Uh, but for those who are curious, it's it's there and available. And, and I appreciate that about Sparrow Wallet. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's great. Um, and then once you're ready to spend, you can go to the same in Sparrow Wallet, and you can input the address that you want to spend some Bitcoin to. You can actually add several addresses. Um, so you can see here that I, I've added like three different addresses to receive Bitcoin from the one input address I got here. You can put a label if you'd like, you can select the amount that you'd like to send. Um, you can you can hit max to spend your your total wallet balance if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, you can select your fee rate by changing this slider, and then you've got this cool chart that's being. Um, popular information from that space uh, uh, and then you can you know see what your fee rate is going to be this tells you like this gives you an idea of how soon your transaction is going to get included into the blockchain so anytime you send bitcoin you have to you have to pay a small miners fee to to incentivize the miners to include your transaction in a block. And then once your transaction gets included into a block, it's part of the immutable ledger. And for every block that's added into that ledger behind the block that contains your transaction, you get another confirmation. Um, so the more confirmations you have, the more embedded into that immutable ledger your transaction is. So if, if you're transacting with someone, it's typically a good idea to wait for a few block confirmations um, before deciding that the transaction is complete. Like if you are selling a car to someone, for example, and you meet in a parking lot, don't just hand them the title and the keys and walk away as soon as they send you Bitcoin. Um, you will want to wait until you see some confirmations of that transaction uh, before you can feel confident that it will not be reversed or changed somehow. That's how you build a transaction in Sparrow Wallet. You, you can either um, just paste that address if you have copied it from the person that gave it to you, or uh, if you have a webcam hooked up to your computer, you can click on this icon, it'll open up, it'll launch your camera, and then you can display a QR code, and it'll get that information from the QR code. And then you just want to hit create transaction. Uh, and then you're, you have a chance to review all those details. Um, an, another cool feature is that you can actually add a delay that's based on either block height or on a particular date. Um, so like if you didn't want this transaction to be broadcast right now, 
but for whatever reason there was a particular block that you wanted um to trigger when this transaction gets broadcast and you could set that up or a certain Oh, now that you mention it, lock time, because this is a feature I asked, you know, of uh, Ben Kaufman from, you know, the co-developer of, of, of Spectre, whether it's possible, whether it would be possible, you know, to, to integrate a, a, a lock feature, like like for the total amount of Bitcoin you have, you know, not, not for a specific transaction, but for a low, for a total amount, you know, you want to, you know, you can, uh, that you can just go in, you know, and, and just, just lock it up for 10 years or so, whatever, one year, 10 years, you know, and so that nobody, uh, uh, not even yourself, you know, can can unlock it. <laughs> well, you know, oh. that would be great. You know, sort of a so that even you know that that would be the perfect plausible deniability because you know you don't even need a plausible deniability. Uh, you know, if you're getting whatever robbed or or whatever beaten up because you say you know it's locked up. You know, it, uh, it's it's going to be unlocked in ten years from now. Right. So that, I, that I'm sense. not sure that Sparrow Wallet has that capability. Um, I don't if think it either. does. I'm not aware. Of it. Yeah, this is probably just for specific transactions. So you can lock it, right? So you can you can say you proc procrastinated. You're delaying sort of the 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 transaction, uh, right? Yeah. So this this is like you're you're building a transaction but you're just telling it that you don't want the transaction to be broadcast until a specific block or a specific date. Yeah. Um, so I was where, just asking myself, whereas, you know, how difficult would it be to integrate, you know, a feature like that? You just, lock, you know, for the total amount of, of, of U2, U2XOs you have or, or Bitcoin you have, you know, you just lock it up, you know? I mean, how, how difficult would that be? I mean, you know, since I'm not a tech developer, but maybe we can ask Craig Raw, or and somebody, uh, uh, but I think Ben 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 Kaufman from Spectre, he, he said it's actually a pretty good idea, and they're gonna discuss that with Stefan Stignirev, the security expert, also. <clears throat> well, that's exciting. I I think it's a it's a great feature to have, um, you know, and, and Craig Raz, he's the developer of Sparrow Wallet. He's mm -hmm. pretty forward thinking, so. I'm sure he would be open to the idea. Yeah, I'm if, if he hasn't already integrated it, there, it could be that Sparrow Wallet has those capabilities, and I'm just not aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, but that—that's a great question for the Telegram channel. Um, so yeah, once once you've reviewed the details and you've set a delay, if you if you want to. Um, then you're ready to finalize the transaction by clicking this large blue button at the bottom. And then the wallet, if you had set a password, then the wallet's gonna ask you for that password. And this is this is not your BIP39 phrase. This is the same password that's used to encrypt your wallet. Uh, on the wallet data on your computer. So you would enter that passphrase, hit unlock, and then you can hit sign. And then once that transaction is signed by your wallet, then it's ready to be broadcast out to the network. And once you hit broadcast, your node will send the transaction to its peers on the network that it's connected to and that'll propagate throughout the Bitcoin network until it gets pulled out of the mempool and into a block. Um, and that that's all I had for Sparrow Wallet. So, you know, in conclusion, it's, it's available to download on desktop, Linux, Mac, Windows. Um, it, it really is easy to connect to your own node. I know that if you've never done this before, it can seem really overwhelming at the beginning, but um, it really is pretty easy once you actually get your hands on it and do it yourself. Um, Sparrow Wallet has a ton of awesome features, you know, from single SIG to multi SIG to hardware wallet integration to 
watch only wallet um to being its own little block explorer it, it's just got a ton of great features it's really well designed um and yeah it, jump in the telegram group for community support if you have questions specifically about sparrow wallet um you know feel free to reach out to me too um yeah and that that's all i had for sparrow that's awesome man so yeah so you know the different ways to connect uh, to, uh this is the experience i mean i just wanted to share with you you know i i have a my note i already had my wallet set up uh, via specter so all i did is you know connect it first uh, through the tour onion address which i found in the tour services of my note and uh you know, I connected it. It re it took a while until you know it, it resynced everything, and then I'd uploaded this uh, the uh, just for testing purposes. You know, the single wallets, uh, but I didn't. Uh, the only thing I didn't test is the multi sig. I could have you know uploaded the multi sig, but um, multi you know multi sig files from Spectre to Sparrow. So it's you know very compatible everything, and um, yeah, so. Uh, so let's yeah so if uh people want to uh follow you uh Econ alchemist you they can find you on twitter on your website econalchemist.com and the website of um let me see uh of sparrow wallet sparrowwallet.com and the the previous tutorials we made on blue wallet and samurai wallet so far uh, you can find on youtube on my youtube channel or just uh, as an audio, but I think for most noobs, I think most useful as an instructional guide to follow the YouTube video tutorial, uh, which we did together with you. And yeah, any other final uh, comments or uh, suggestions? Um, you know, I just, yeah, I know it got a little choppy when I was trying to uh, explain the inputs and outputs in that transaction. It's just, you know, it's been two months since I created that transaction. So I, it's difficult to recall exactly what was going on there. But, you know, don't don't let that stop you from from moving forward. Um, you know, just keep trying to learn about this stuff and those features are there it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use them um to get started you can you can get started and there are very simple ways to do this stuff um but i just i made that a little bit more complicated than it needed to be um but yeah other than that you know i, I think you covered everything that that i want to say so yeah awesome good job. beautiful well brother so uh, yeah, if you have any other final thoughts or um, any links, resources, anything coming up, uh, what's the next uh, tutorial we're going to do uh, in this series? Is it? So, yeah, the last piece of this is um, purchasing non-KYC Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, super important. BISC. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So that'll be coming up soon. Yeah, non-KYC is, is the way to go. I mean, because... I mean, it's just, I don't know, the dangers and the risks uh, with our, from whatever side, with it be, you know, ta taxation or <laughs> regulatory or, or leakages, you know, or to criminals or whatever. It's, it's, I mean, the dangers cannot be emphasized uh, enough. So, yeah, it's good that we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I look forward to diving into that with you. All right. Well, brother, thank you so much, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. All right. I appreciate cool. everything. <laughs> okay. Right. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. You too. Bye. Okay. Guys, thank you so much again for listening and share this with your friends, family. And, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, hodling, your Bitcoin on a single wallet, multi-sig wallet, uh, security, privacy is of utmost importance. 
and you know and in that from that pro progression would it be a mobile wallet to a you know harder wallet and eventually you know uh, with desktop applications such as sparrow or specter so these are really great tools and it's it becomes so user friendly much much more user friendly than ever before but it's getting easy easier from day to day so make sure you follow econo alchemist on twitter on uh, check out his website is also his articles also been published on bitcoinmagazine.com and i'm going to put everything on the show notes if you have any suggestions questions let me know what you think and looking forward to my next uh, tutorial together with econo alchemist and yeah subscribe to my youtube channel and my podcast platform on anchor.fm slash cave where it's distributed to all major podcast platforms and my youtube channel follow me on twitter cave thanks so much